Ladies and gentlemen, I have the complete honor and delight of speaking with the one and only Michelle Bowens again for episode three of our series on the sources of peer-to-peer. -peer. And we've already had a wonderful conversation on Cortani, who I wouldn't have known about with Mr. without Mr. Bowens. We talked about Carl Panier. And uh, we talked on the first episode of the notion of kind of this capital nation state, where we always have to think about capital nation and state together. If we don't, that can lead to various mistakes where you're just st stuck in this triplex thinking that you're making uh, that you're making advancements when actually you're just moving between capital nation and state. We talked about a lot with Planier on this idea that there's a difference between market economies and market societies. And just because you create a market economy like capitalism, you actually have to also change the social imagination for people to understand the market economy. You cannot assume that if you create a market economy, people will just see it and know how to think by it. And we talked a lot about the oddness, um, how odd it is that we're so used now to looking at a cup and saying, that's worth $10. Really? Where in nature did you learn that cup was worth $10? You come to be so habituated, your habitat is some sociologists think that you don't even realize it. And how that right there opens up thinking and possibility on changing social imagination, or we mentioned Koratani's new book on spirits that's in, that's in the works on this idea of thinking a new spirit. And if we can do that, that can open some new possibilities of how we're told toward the world, which may open up possibilities of a global commons. But today we thought we would start talking about some of these mac macro historical theories that different thinkers have, those different frameworks, why that is important. Um, because if, uh, if we don't understand uh, how history is developed, not merely in facts, but in this unfolding that brings with it something about how humans operate, their subjectivity, and the civilizations that they are in, then we may actually end up repeating various mistakes in the past or not prioritizing the infrastructure or the things that we need to prioritize in order to perhaps um, beget a new social horizon and a new spirit and a new way of operation. So we thought we would talk about that. So I'll give it to Mr. Bowens to review some thinking. And again, uh, Michelle, we are really always a delight to speak with you. I um, Every time I speak with you, I, I think about it for weeks afterwards. So it's really, a, really a treat to have a chance uh, uh, to do it again. So thank you for being here, sir. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, I, you know, I, you know, I, I love your work as well. Um, and uh, so maybe I, I want to say something about how I started doing this because so ba basically you know my my work for the last twenty years have been has been the study of peer to peer dynamics. Um, so I, I had this intuition that you know in tribal societies we have a value regime that's based on commoning and gifting. You know what Karatani calls mode A. Um, and then we shift to markets and states about 5,000 years ago. Um, but then my intuition was when I discovered the internet that we was, that we now had this technology again to scale up mode A, right? So to, so the, the basic dynamic that I think was a drama of human history was that if you wanted to scale, you had to become bigger. If you became bigger, you were stronger, and you could you could defeat the small, and so the conviviality aspects of kinship-based societies could not hold, uh, unless maybe in marginal, you know, like in the in the world as a whole became subject to civilization, right? And so civilization, uh, there's various ways to uh, to define it. Uh, but I think civilization, you know, is essentially a class society. So we move from hunter-gathering to craft agrarian and mining. Uh, and we get, you know, class societies with a writing elite, with market, market and stage division of labor. And, and we get a, a deeper level of social alienation because people are no longer living with the people they love and are close to, but are you know, have to live in, in large anonymous uh, cities, you know, where freedom is constrained and may, they may be slaves and anyway. And so here's where Spengler comes in. Um, so Spengler has a kind of a streamlined uh, history of civilization. And it's very important uh, for Spengler is that Civilization is a spiritual response, right? It's it's not just power. It's basically 
how do we give meaning to our alienation? Let me briefly mention another book, which actually is very good about that. It's it's called Beyond Civilization, and it's from Keith Chandler. And so he says, basically, you know, before civilization in the tribal and kinship-based societies where you have animism and shamanism and totemism, there is a very kind of unified view of the world, which is very close to natural cycles, uh, close to the animal spirits. Um, and basically he argues that, you know, a shaman from Siberia, once you have civilization, you have a response to trauma of civilization. And East Chandler makes a cross, East, West, North, South, which in my view makes sense. So I'll, I'll just briefly explain what he says. Um, so it's all about relation order, like, you know, defining the meaning of reality, basically, right? So you have the East. Illusion, right? So order is illusion, and you have to go to non-order. The you know without any characteristics, but in the and so you reject reality in a way, and you go inward. And for example, in the Buddhist uh, you know society, which I know a bit better because I live in Thailand, uh, you know the original idea is that the people have like five commandments but they're basically at the service of the monks, right? They have to make it possible for the monks to do their meditation and clean the karma of everybody. Uh, so but so the world is, is, the material world is secondary, but in the West is the opposite in a fundamental way, at least according to Keith Chan, he says, you know, signing the Genesis is there is chaos and darkness and God creates order and, and order is good. And the role of believers is to make the world better according to the divine plan, to put more order in the world, right? So there you have already a, a contradiction between both, right? Between like very different civilizational responses, but what is the meaning of reality? China, he says, is the only one that has both. The yin and yang, chaos and order has to have to keep keep in balance. Not too much of this, not too much of the other. You know, you zigzag uh, and you try to keep the balance. And then the Aztecs is the opposite. You know, the, their gods are cruel and, and want blood. And so, you know, in a tragic world, you have to sacrifice blood just so that it exists. So, you know, this is like a cross of meaning in that book. And I, I think it's illuminating. So, okay. Spengler is similar in that he says that every civilization has a prime symbol. That, you know, it works out over like a thousand years. And that's specific to Spengler, that he sees civilization as an organism, which is born, matures, gets old and dies in you know four seasons it's very controversial in 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 spengler is that he says they're not connected civilizations are not connected right we, we, the, uh, today we think the opposite but he thought no they're not connected they have their own logic and for example he would argue that even mathematics is different in each civilization there's no universal mathematics there is a civilizational mathematics that corresponds to this basic life feeling. Um, so what's interesting and generative about Spengler, even if you don't agree with his basic hypothesis, is that suddenly you can compare civilizations, not just, what's the word, diachronically, like at the same time, right? But at the same time in their evolution. So you can now, suddenly you can say, well, what happens at the end of the Western civilization, which I think we feel, and the end of the Roman Empire, and the end of China, right? So is there something that we can say about end phase of civilization? So it's so it's not useful for Springer to compare 
you know, let's say Europe to China now, it's more interesting to compare Europe now with Rome, the end of Rome, because we we in the same phase. And so the, the so for Spengler is when you are is very important. Um, and okay, so he has this kind of streamlined idea of how civilization works. So civilization is born from an encounter between a subject, subjected people and, and, and uh, conquering people. Because otherwise you have tribalism and, and, and custom, right? In order to have civilization, you need this kind of creative spark where a minority of armed people who need to dominate uh, you know, uh, other people need to find a way to be legitimate. Yeah, so, so, you know, there needs to be some kind of fusion between those two people, and that is what creates a new civilization. You know, this kind of uh, a common prime symbol that unites, um, and to bring it back to Karatani, our previous, uh, you know, uh, discussion, right? This is mode B, which is you produce class to be legitimate and so measures the people like welfare systems, you know, there, there'll be redistribution as well. Um, okay, so here's what he says. So every civilization starts with two castes, the spiritual caste and the warrior caste. And, you know, the basic idea is the warrior caste, you know, they have to be you were saying on Spengler civilizational thinking, streamlining, etc., so forth. Right. So he has this kind of streamlined version of you know, the evolution of a civilization over time. So uh, first of all, you you need a mixture because this is not tribal, right? It's a conquering people and a conquered people, and somehow they then have to live together, uh, and so they need legitimacy and and you know unify, etc. Uh, and so at the beginning of every civilization, you have two castes, the, the priestly caste and the warrior class. And basically, you know, the, the priestly class is there to civilize, civilize and humanize the warrior class because it can behave the same way with its own people that it behaves, you know, when it's conquering uh, territory uh, or fighting enemies. Um, and if that is successful... You know, eventually they'll have cities and the cities will grow. And paradoxically, that creates a third caste, which is the burghers, the bourgeoisie, as you know, we say in Europe, uh, which is, you know, the people of the city, the, the merchants, the art, the crafts people. And eventually they will ally with the monarch against the castes and they will abolish the caste system and it will become like an empire, uh, you know, which is no longer the same it's it's uh, has a bureaucracy and this is becoming centralized and as it grows further it will develop a fourth class which is a proletariat and that will create democracy and democracy lasts 200 years and then it collapses in caesarism and that's kind of the end of the civilizational cycle so that's kind of like a streamlined process which he claims you can find, you know, in different uh, civilizational settings, but like that pattern is definitely there according according to him. The difference is that each of them has a different, what he calls a prime symbol. Now, I just want to give one example. For example, you know, he will say that Greek Hellenism is basically a body in space. You know, and, and he shows the, you know, the nature of architecture and sculpture in Greece. Uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the, the human being can see the polis and that's it. And so it's very much a body in space. And Euclidean mathematics reflects that. Now, if you move to what he calls the Magian uh, civilization, that's an original concept by him, which is he actually puts Byzantium you know, and Persia and the Middle East in one in one common uh, sphere. And he says, well, did you notice that the mosques 
and the Orthodox churches have the same structure, which is like a dome. And it's basically a protective dome. So people live in an enclosed space protected by, you know, the, and it's not, they're not looking to the outside. You know, there's no windows like in, uh, for example, Gothic cathedrals. Gothic cathedrals, you know, they have immediately shooting to the sky. So that's typically what he calls Faustian civilization. That's Western civilization. Only starts in the year 1000 through the merger of the Germans and their spirituality of the forest with, you know, the Roman Catholic uh, legacy of what was left from the both Hellenistic and Magian influences on, 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 on Christianity. So, and that will create 998, I think, you know, with, with Otto II in, in Germany and the creation of the Holy Roman Empire, that's for him is Western civilization. So it only starts as 1,000, right? And given that every civilization is only 1,000 years old, before it kind of, uh, you know, loses its dynamic qualities, right? Uh, so we are, you know, basically due in Europe, in a, you know, if you believe Spengler, we are due to this kind of end cycle, right? And then... What's interesting in, in, for for him is that at the end of civilization, there's no utopia, right? There's no positive vibe. So you'll have the Stoics, right? Which is about uh, distancing yourself from the tragedy of life. You have the Epicureans, you know, go with your friends in a garden and enjoy um and then the christian he says you know there's no hope at all in this world you know you have to focus on the other one right so you know that's kind of maybe what we feel today as well where there's a lack of projective capacity like we don't know where we're going and we can't even imagine you know uh a future you know what uh mark fisher called capitalist realism we're stuck we we can more easily imagine the end of the world and the end of than another type of society so that's so that's what spengler brings uh you know this thing of like being able to compare across time similar stages right okay i should say one one thing more of course he knows that you know china lasted you know some several thousand years so he says that when a civilization continues it's no longer created right i mean taoism buddhism Confucianism, they'll never come back. They've done their job, they innovated, but they're now fossils, right? They're they're fossil civilizations. Uh, so that's so that's Spengler, and of course you you can immediately see you know what people would criticize about it, which is that there's no connection between civilizations. There's no evolution between civilizations there's no you know one civilization that if learns from the other no it's like a quite a deterministic um sense but i still find it generative because i you know i i think he is onto something that there is definitely you know this kind of dynamic playing out of of you know civilizations get tired and and lose their dynamism and so this is all what i think basically spengler brings to the table i don't know if you have any questions you know otherwise i i would move on to tony b no i i think it's fascinating i mean i i you know i i would just put a a note on that tension between this idea of civilizations being distinct but not related i think that's a massive tension where like, you know, we, we've talked before on this idea that culture seems to cross-pollinate trade routes, Silk Roads, Peter, you know, Quinn and all these different things. And yet at the same time, it does seem as if there just are distinctions between civilizations. So I, I just I think the tension between saying there's no distinctions, but then acting as if distinctions are independent of any influence is one of the great tensions of all civilizational thinking and also economics that right. i think if we don't think 
we can't deal with this problem of the fossilization of civilization. There is this tendency of things in their very success creating the conditions of their entropy, right? Like that's kind of the Peter Pogne, yeah, the yeah. rethinking the world. And if we don't yeah, yeah. realize that the greatest threat to success is success, per se, that the greatest threat to freedom is freedom, per se, that the very thing right. that leads to prosperity is what leads to the state of entropy then you're all you at most can do is recreate the conditions that gave you that entropy, if you will, uh, and then just keep going over and over again. So I think correctly yeah. identifying that is really, really important. Uh, and like I say, I think there's major use in that. Um, and th but that's why, you know, we need multiple models. So I'll let you uh, go on to the on to yeah, the next yeah, it's a perspective, right? So I, 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 I'm not looking for Spengler to say he's completely right or completely wrong. I'm, I'm, I think it's a dynamic and generative perspective. And, you know, the, the way I look at it, and so this is an anecdote, but in my life it was important. So I was visiting this this small town in France called Limoges, and I had a, a, a guide from the labor movement, right? And so he would show me a house, and he says, well, you know, for the last 20 years, this, you know, it was this, and and, you know, those people owned it, and that's what they did. But before that, and then he would give a story, and he said, and before that, and would give me another story. And so I realized that, you know, I was in my 30s, that this is what culture is about, right? I was just seeing a, a bricks and stones, and I could say, well, it's beautiful or not beautiful. But culture, you know, his culture gave me a whole, like, added layers of meaning that I, and so that's how I read these macro historians as giving me patterns that I can use to illuminate reality that I probably wouldn't have come up by myself. And and by and by combining them, getting a more rich understanding of you know what what, what is potentially there. So I just want to say this so that for Spengler the first 500 years are dynamic and the second 500 years are declining, right? So he calls it culture and civilization. So the culture is when it's dynamic, and usually it's a world of city-states, like the polis in Greece, the Italian city-states, the you know the different country the states in China, and then they battle it out until they exhaust themselves, and then a semi-peripheric or a peripheric barbarian tribe will take over the whole civilizational sphere. Uh, but by that time is the is the soldiers, engineers, and merchants. And what they do is they no longer renew the civilization, they just spread it by copying its forms and extending its fear. Right? Like Alexander, you know, using the model of the Greek polis and just spreading it everywhere until in northern India, and then Rome again, you know, so Alexander was a barbarian Macedonian. And then Rome was even more, you know, outside of the sphere. Uh, so, that, the, so that's the dynamic between cultures and civilizations that that he sees, and so it's very deterministic. Um, Just gonna know. Um, so there's a few things. First, I think that idea of using perspectives and theories as different, like. There's the danger of what I like to call mono theory, which is having a single theory of everything. And what we really want to be is almost like polytheorist, just like polytheorism, where we have many theories that we work together. Because if we believe something like kind of a curt girdle or some sort of incompleteness, that every single theory has some kind of saturation point, some sort of point at which they cannot account right. for. And we actually need to really go into a theory to understand it, to reach the point where we can see the quote unquote, what I call godel point, which is the incompleteness that in that actually unfolds new creative possibilities on different and, things. And that's what I learned from you, right? I, I learned from you at some point in one of your videos that you compare the society to the girl theorem and you said somewhere that a society cannot found itself fully on its own understanding of itself, right? So the, the rational always depends on the non-rational, not the irrational, the non-rational, like basic axioms. And those basic axioms are exactly what Spengler means with prime symbols. You know, there's like a or decision made by a creative minority, you know, the ones that 
take over basically and have some coherence between them. And then they will spread that basic decision about what the world should be, you know, and over time. And of course, it's something immaterial. So they're discovering it themselves as well. And so a civilization is an unfolding of this immaterial idea, like almost like a DNA, a cultural DNA that unfolds over time. And so important is, and that's why why empires fight, right? Is that they they cannot tolerate another prime symbol, yeah. right? This is why the the Western Church, you know, uh, repressed the the Qatars in the mm. you know the because it represented a completely different value system that they could not tolerate and this is why you know the timberlane i think you know destroyed baghdad because that was a rival civilization mm -hmm. and he basically killed two hundred thousand people so that they could not reproduce themselves intellectually right why the mughals uh killed the buddhist monks right so you you have to destroy the middle layer so that the the rival value system cannot reproduce itself Right, but then you still need with the people who are there, you still need to create something coherent, and so the civilization will be the the encounter between a mixture of right. So that allows me to go to Toynbee, if you don't mind, right? Who has a very specific idea about this? So, so let me first say that all the people that we can discuss now, Toynbee, Sorokin. Quigley and others are all reacting to Spengler, right? Spengler was like a nuclear bomb uh, because before him, you know, civilization was Europe. Like European stuff, they were civilized and they were civilizing the rest of the world. And there was a progress narrative. And in a very paradoxical way, Spengler was the first postmodernist, right? Saying, no, Europe is just a civilization like another one. It will die like everybody else. And it's not superior to any other one. It's just different. Right? So that was like a new idea in civilizational thinking. And that set in motion, uh, you know, those people I just mentioned, but even Gebser and Campbell, a lot of people were reacting to Spengler. And I put them under a general bucket of culturalists because they stress human agency and the role of culture, right? Then you have another basket, which is very related, which are called the spiritualists. And those would be people like Aurobindo, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, who, who, who fill in their culture with their spirituality. So they go further in their interpretation. And that's like two buckets in one. And in the 70s, they would be overtaken by world systems analysis, which is neo-materialist, neo-Marxist, geopolitical, you know, thinking. And then in the 90s, they would lose their hegemony to the third school, which is big history, which uses systems theory, complexity, and cybernetics to find a unified vision of change in the world of matter, life, and culture. But we're not there yet. So today we discuss the first bucket, right? And I just want to create like a, an understandable frame so that people can place the ideas. So Toynbee uh, rejects the static view of Spengler. You know, there for, for, for Toynbee, civilizations do learn from each other and he has like three generations the uh like the class the pre-classical you know like mesopotamia the classical greece and rome and then the post-classical broadly right and and the transition from one generation to another is different so very peculiar about his vision 
is if you look at the end of the Roman Empire and the end of the Chinese Han Empire, which is the same time, uh, six you know sixth century uh, uh, A.D. and and you know it's a climate event on the Eurasian continent, right? That that creates that. So he he says you have a creative minority that creates a civilization. Uh, and they do this through mimetic learning. Um, and that works for a time, but as they, you know, entropy sets in, it, it becomes routine, they lose their dynamism, it becomes a dominant minority. So as it loses legitimacy, it has to be more and more authoritarian to keep, you know, the civilization together. And especially in the conditions of slave-based civilizations, it creates an enormous proletariat. So people who lose their tribal identity, their local identity, they're uprooted. Uh, they live in these giant cities like Rome, and you know, and and, and they're not happy. And as the civilization declines, so that's you know the same as with Spengler. He also recognizes the Klein. The proletariat creates world churches, world religions, because you can no longer be local. So the, the paradoxically, the empire creates the conditions for a world religion because everybody is atomized, right? And he stresses, which is also in Kaldun says the same, that an empire is incompatible, incompatible with tribalism. It has to destroy tribalism as a rival allegiance right so basically it disarms the people in the empire pacifies civic life pushes the violence outside to the borders and hires barbarians to keep order right and the, the more it declines the more it uses barbarians and mercenaries to keep order Right, so when when it's no longer able to defend itself, it will eventually be overrun by barbarian tribes who will take over political power, but don't have the capacity to manage a complex civilization, and so they then need to ally with the world churches, which become imperial churches which have become imperial churches and that creates the seed of a new civilization so right rome uh when it declines the germanic tribes come in and they ally with the catholic church and that creates a new christian medieval civilization which is fundamentally different from the roman civilization but it's that that mixture right so it, it talks about proletarians it talks about Volker wandering, so the, the barbaric nomadism. And it talks about, um, I think he calls it world churches, but I, I forgot the exact term he uses. But that's basically, you know, the what it's about. It's this kind of, whether it's Buddhism or Catholicism, it plays the same role. Right. And and so all these sec the second generation civilizations all end up with those dynamics okay so so for stone civilization learned from each other there is like a a deposit of knowledge techniques that you know they learn so the level of technology will be higher the level of complexity will be higher so that's different from spengler he recognizes a kind of evolution uh, he also believes that uh, a civilization is about challenge and response. Uh, so, you know, basically there's some climate change in Mesopotamia, a uh, swampification of the rivers and a desertification in North Africa. So in order to stay, if the population wants to stay, they need to invent civilization, like irrigation systems and temples, and and right, they need to do that to survive. 
So civilization is always a response to a challenge. And I think it's very useful, but this is for me, to have like at least a tripartite form of interpretation, which is the material basis, ecology, climate change, material production technologies, how humanity responds to it. So what's the form of society that responds to that challenge? And then this might be another debate, you know, the form of consciousness that um, allows us to create a society. We see the world in a certain way, and so we respond in a certain way, and that depends on our mode of consciousness. And just a very brief foray, William Irwin Thompson, which we can discuss uh, in an another time, you know, he says, dark ages are when the structure of consciousness actually changes. You need, and you know, I compare it on a personal level. So if you have some kind of crisis in your life, you don't have to change because you can go do something else, develop some other side of, you, of yourself, right? But if everything goes wrong at the same time, then you, you are really have to change, right? But no, I right. just gonna say, I think that's magnificent because like if there's something else you can do to avoid changing, you'll do that. There has to be almost like a dark phase for everything all at once. So you lose plausible deniability and that is going to force some sort of deeper change. Otherwise, you'll just switch from bowling to ice cream or swimming to golf or exactly, something. Right? Exactly, right. Yeah, yeah. So people always try to solve their issues within the paradigm. It's only when it really, really doesn't work anymore within that paradigm. So people start exiting the paradigm, right? And then they start experimenting with seed forms. And so the thing is that a dark age is defined by a total collapse of markets and states, right? You f you fall back to local localism. And there is a book now, Sing Chu, he's a Singaporean uh, scholar in the World System School who talks about, you know, the world ecological degradation and his second volume is called Recurring Dark Ages. And it's very clear that dark ages are regenerative. So like the pollen count and the number of animals. So, so a civilization always overreaches Exhaust. It's you know it it oh, it takes too much trees. It it creates deforestation, salinization, and all kinds of stuff. And it's only a dark age which then allows uh, you know like a local healing, uh, and that's basically what the medieval West did. You know it can it healed uh, the devastation of the Roman Empire, um, and so that's another story which I'm. Maybe we can talk about in another time, but you know, I have a theory that it's the mutualized commons-based institutions that actually do that healing. So we have market and states as extractive institutions and the commons as regenerative institutions. Oh yeah, no, I was just gonna say with that, um, I think without a commons, you can't, you know, Nassim Talib talks about anti-fragility or different things. You know, you have fragile, robust, and anti-fragile, where anti-fragile is what gains from disorder. Like without disorder, you become robust and stagnant, but if you're fragile, you break. Anti-fragility is the ability to gain from disorder, right? And without a commons, it's as if you're missing the anti-fragile. You don't have the ability to actually engage right. in the regenerative. So I, I think that's very important. Yeah. It's, you know, markets and states are designed to win competitions. And in order to do that, they have to collect more resources than their rivals. They have no choice. And a commons is designed to survive hundreds of years in a local place. Right? And so there is a, okay, maybe I, I will talk about it now. So I, I, this is my own scheme, and it's you know it's a bit stylized, but I think it's it's right, which is so first you have military congregations, and they secure the civilizational area, like the Teutonic Order secures Eastern Europe for you know Latin Christianity, right? The Templars and the Maltese Order 
secure the Mediterranean from the Muslims for Latin civilization. Uh, when that's done, that gives them room for the craft agrarian institutions to take to take up their role, which is uh, the you know the Benedictines, the Sister Sensiers, they regreen in a very holistic you know uh, fashion agriculture uh, in Europe, and and you know they allow for doubling and tripling of the population through their productivity, right? And they are I call them prayer maximizing enterprises because you know because since you owe everything to the divine, you have to pray. And in order to have time to pray, you have to be very efficient at work to minimize the time you work, right? So they were very productive and invented a lot of techniques. Um, and so when they're successful, and this is something I learned recently. So, you know, the aristocracy uh, stimulates world trade, you know, in luxury goods, but it was the monasteries who created the surplus of bulk goods. And that allowed the cities to emerge, right? And who do you see in the early cities? The craft uh, unions, the guilds, right? Again, a mutualistic form. And the advantage of these mutualistic forms are that they create a surplus, which is not appropriated by a private elite. And so everything goes into the reproduction of the system and the expansion of the system. Um, okay, that's my theory. That's not Spengler, that's not Toynbee, but it's, I think, an, a nice compliment. Um, I like that. Theory. That is good. Yeah. yeah, and that's, of course, in a dark age, comes into its own because there's nothing else, right? But then, paradoxically, as they create a surplus, that surplus will create a room for extraction, Right? Because they they're not alone. They always have the, the the spiritual class and the warrior class, right? And they they're together, but also in tension. Well, it, it's almost. I mean, without a commons or without a spiritual class, there's a way in which people are not going to create a surplus without a, without something driving them beyond market forces, right? Like because there's no market yes. there. So what? So there's not going to be a surplus prepared to kind of move in as you kind of recover so there's no there's no like you have to have like if we think of the benedict monasteries or these different things these craftsmen like they're doing it for god they're doing it so they have more time to pray they're doing it for these things and so they've developed skills it's that can delayed gratification it's delayed gratification and here i might introduce sorokin here because this is also very important right mm. so sorokin uh is called social and cultural dynamics in four volumes I, I read, you know, like a synthetic uh, one volume. And I can tell you, it's, it's really boring because it's he wants to prove his, his thesis. So it's like an endless list of, you know. Uh, but the point of, uh, of Sorokin is oscillation. So we, there is, he said there is a sensate phase and an ideate phase. Sensate periods is when people believe the only reality is material and the object of life is to increase material well-being. Ideate is when they reject materiality and focus everything on the spiritual plane. Right? And the, here's how they fit together. So Rome at the end is an extremely sensate civilization. Right, you have a ruling class, and you know they can have sex with with who they want, and they have slaves and and you know and and children and 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 um, you know and they get weak and they don't fight anymore and they need to have mercenaries. That creates a rejection, and that's Christianity, right? Christianity is an ideate rejection of a of a sensate decline. You know, and it's ascetic, it's anti-materialists, it, you know, rejects this this world for the other world. Um, and so, 
um, basically you have an active phase, an emergent phase, a mature phase, and a declining phase. So for Sorokin, we are now in a declining sensate civilization. And he called it cynical sensate because we don't even believe in it anymore, right? Uh, so that is going to create a reaction. Now, he has a third possibility, and this is very important to understand. This is the integrative. He calls it idealistic instead of IDA. And this is a this is a puzzle for me because he says integrative phases like the 5th century BC in Greece and the 12th century AD in the West, you have a declining ideate and an and a the birth of a sensate counter reaction. So for a time period, you have an ideal combination of both where people can pay the same type of attention to the material world and to the spiritual world. And that leads to very, you know, very high art. And, but, uh, but art that means something. So not Baroque and Rococo, but, you know, the like very beautiful material spiritual art. What, what puzzles me, I, I tell you my problem with this, and I, I don't have a solution for that yet, is that I think today, so Sorokin, for example, he says, there's a rejection of the sensate, right, already, but it takes a weird form of like cubism and, you know, that are that are ideated, but not, not fully. They're like, something is missing. Um, at the same time, you know, people like me and the people I follow, I, I really believe we're integrated. But according to Sorkin, this is not a time, right? He, he, there is no, there is no declining idea that could merge with a, we are at a declining sensate. So normally we would have an idea reaction. That would be his expectation. Uh, you know, a non-materialist reaction. Um, you know, and maybe you can see that, you know, deep ecology or, you know, like ultra ecological reactions, uh, but I don't really see it yet anyway. So that's, that's kind of what, what I'm struggling to understand, uh, because my intuition is that we are going towards an integrative phase, you know, subjective or, or objective. I see all the big thinkers. That's what they think about. No, I, I it doesn't fit in Sorokin's oscillations theory. So maybe we should amend him, or maybe there's something I don't understand. No, that's that's very interesting. I I mean, there's something about I like the notion of as you go into decline, there's a certain ideation because it seems as if there has to be people that are motivated by something beyond the immediate physical or material horizon. Uh, and so they're kind of, in a sense, building up the reserves, the spiritual reserve or the ideation reserve so that then, um, you know, it can move in once the entropy has set in on the alternative to then introduce some negentropy to keep things from going. Right. Um, and so there's a way in which I wonder if if there is something about online spaces or the liminal web where the where what you're what you're having is the ideation is m moving off of the geography or moving off of the political stage. And it's actually more of than, you know, people talk about the network state where it's, it's more of people all like the new civilization is almost online or offline maybe. And the online, you see people talking like if we, you know, Verveke talks, you know, Henriquez, Verveke, there's this notion of relational metaphysics. There's a new kind of metaphysics, trans yeah. vectorism and different things that has a certain. But they're all integrative, right? They're integrative. Right. They're not, they're not idealistic or I, they're not ideate. They don't reject the material world. Right. Right. They they bring back the spirit in the material world. Yes. Now, I think that's unique about our current transition that that this seems to me um like a very important trend yep. that this is happening. That you know, high level thinking, high level feeling is going in that direction. In hol holism, integration, matter and spirit, you know, merge together. I think this is what the current transition is about.
Is there a way? Not I could to... be wrong because maybe I live in a bubble, right? But that's no, why... it, this is really interesting. That's... Um, is there a way where the exploding nihilism is kind of the rejection of the material world where we wouldn't consider it like classically it would be heaven that would be ideal, right? But is there something about nihilism that's kind of the form of idealism today as the vast anti-idealism? Because you're rejecting the material world and your spirituality is uh, is actually kind of the void, uh, is kind of annihilation, the postmodernism. There, I that's a weird yeah. thought. But if I wonder if nihilism, but that would be, yeah, that would be for for Sorokin, that would be cynical sensei. Yeah, right. You know, it's like the logical outcome. And okay, let, let, let me bring another author in. Um, so this is a book by Vincent Citeau. Uh, and I can't remember the title. It's, a, it's in French, it's downstairs. I, I almost finished uh, with it. But it's, it's a comparative history of thought, which includes philosophy, in eight different civilizations. Hmm. And he comes up with a scheme where he says in every civilizational cycle, and there can be more than one, like China has three. I think India has three as well. In between you have dark ages. But within a civilizational cycle, you have pre-classical, classical and post-classical. So Pre-classical, and it's very compatible with you know what I've read from the other authors that I, that we discussed, right? Pre-classical means um, basically the spiritual response, the creation of a civilizational response based on a particular prime symbol, you know, uh, a, a value uh, decision, basically, right? In the classical period reason tries to understand the spirit so you get kind of a mix and that's the high period for him but then when the rationalism wins the post-classical that's the beginning of the decline because it has lost its roots in the non-rational and it turns on itself right so the thing that you call postmodernism. You know, you can find it in other civilizations with other names with very similar effects, according to him. Um, and so I, I find it also very convincing, you know, that... that uh, and so, yeah, after rationalism, there's nihilism. And, you know, Spengler would say that, Sorkin would say that, uh, even Quigley, I think, would agree with that. That that this is, you know, that the, the end game is hyper rationalism turning into nihilism, because you, you know the you you lost the nourishing uh, relation with the spirit. And Emmanuel Todd is another one I can briefly mention who wrote the defeat of the West, which is an amazing book. You know, he talks about the three stages of religion, the religious stage, the zombie stage, and the zero stage. So, you know, re when religion, you know, a new religion emerges, right, it achieves a lot of things. For example, he says Reformation is responsible for mass literacy. So people want to read because they want to read the Bible. That's that's the motivation for mass literacy. It's spiritual. That's why, why everybody has to be able to read so that they can read the Bible by themselves and, and from their own judgment. Zombie religion for him is when we become rationalistic, but we're still in the thrall of the roots of the religion, right? So basically secularism and humanism but it carries christian values now when we lose those roots that's what he calls religion zero and then we become nihilistic and the only thing that's left is fighting for power and possession mm. that's you know his analysis what is happening with the west and why we go to war and you know why anything goes uh, and wokeism for him, that's like, you know, because there's nothing left. 
uh, we're not even zombie religion anymore. We are the stage zero. Well, well, that's really interesting because I agree with you. It seems to have gone straight to integral, not really gone through a spirit. So it seems like it kind of skipped that. Uh, is there something, because now I'm just speculating because I find this a really interesting insight. Is there something where pluralism, the very encounter of others forces you to like stay in this world because it's more difficult to go to the spiritual realm where it's easier in isolation, where global trade and maybe even there's a kind of self-reference where now you learn about history and you see the unintentional consequences of an isolated religion. And I wonder if there's something about pluralism, maybe the meta move of just being yes. aware of that, that contributes to going straight well, to the integral. Planetarization, right? Planetarization. Mm. So if you look at the civilizational dynamics, so civilization are born, mature, and they die and disappear. Um, so, and, but that's always regional, continental. It's never global, right? So... So there is actually an interesting thesis. This is called Central Civilization Thesis by David Wilkinson. And he says, you know, when the Western Roman Empire collapses, that's not the end of civilization because Byzantium is going to last another thousand years, right? So civilization as a network of cities never fully disappears. It moves around, but it never, and so that kind of, you know, cities get bigger over time, technology, technological knowledge adds up. So there is definitely an arrow of time. And 400 years ago, we reached planetarization, you know, which then develops and becomes, and, and that's, that's an epic change because all the traditional spiritualities, despite their universalist claims, you know, always remained ethnic in a way, right? So, you know, unity for all Christians, unity for all Muslims, but never unity for everyone, right? And that's a limitation because it seems impossible to have a world religion. So there is no, no hope for any religion to become, you know, a global, a fully global religion. And in a way, you know, that's what my work is about when I talk about cosmolocalism, right? So I always say cosmolocalism is it's fully local and fully cosmic. But with cosmic, I mean planetary, right? So everything that's heavy is local and everything that's light is global and shared. So I, I advocate and I see the seeds emerging for a uh, fundamental attitude, which is, okay, we need to heal the earth locally you know, regenerative activities need to be placed around you and, you know, the soil need to be regenerated and, and repaired and all of that. But we can only do that efficiently if we unite on a global scale and learn from each other, right? And so we are creating a new civilization that is truly planetary and that doesn't have any appropriate spirituality yet. But I think that's what Integrative is trying to do. For example, right? You, you know that I work with the Civilizational Research uh, Institute uh, with, uh, you know, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Dan, uh, Zachary Stein. And Zachary Stein and Mark Gaffney wrote this book called First Principles and First Values, right? And the fundamental innovation in that spiritual path, if you like, is a re-foundation of metaphysics where both matter and spirit co-evolve. And that's completely new because in traditional spirituality, it's always about the changing world of becoming and the static spiritual world of being. What they are saying is different, is that there's also an evolving consciousness and an evolving spiritual world at the same time. And so what they're trying to say is, how can we be fully scientific and fully spiritual at the same time without giving up one or the other? That's truly integrity. You know, I'm not going to say they succeeded, but I think John Verveke, 
you know, with this Neoplatonism, you know, upgraded. It's all the same thing. These people are all, even Jonathan Peugeot, you know, even though he goes back into his orthodox tradition, I think he goes back to it with this mindset. Right? That's that's why we can listen and understand him because he he's, he's not talking about orthodoxy, you know, from a like dogmatic point of view. It's, it's, it's this new form of consciousness which tries to use the tradition, traditional spirituality and make it work for today. So I, I think they're all trying in some fundamental way, trying to find this integrative spiritual thing that fully embraces, you know, cybernetics and systems theory and all of that, right? Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I find it fascinating that many, many, even in the traditional religions, theologies are arising that are far more integral. Like the Trinity has become very central to many Christian denominations, you know, obviously orthodoxy with Peugeot. But, you know, that reading and focus on the Trinity has not been common in the history of Christianity. Uh, and yet there's a something that's being realized. You will have a lot of Protestant churches that really like following an N.T. Wright are not emphasizing rapture. They're emphasizing the kingdom of God versus heaven. There's this interesting change that is happening in the teachings of the theology that are making them far more. Christians may talk about sacramental or incarnational, where the spirit and matter are two sides of the same coin. You see a return of an emphasis on the creative act in Christianity, rather it be Flannery O'Connor. There is the international arts movement, I think, with Mako the Japanese Christian artists. There is a lot of it's very interesting because I do wonder if today. There is something that has changed that has made a traditional religions have to become integral. They have to go back and find something in their theology that justifies an, an integral interpretation that was always already there, but not realized precisely because the world has become global, like in cosmic, like precisely because there's an interconnectivity, like it, what's the Trinity? It's a connection. You know, Jordan Hall has been emphasizing the Trinity, right? Like what is the Trinity other than a weird paradox that is exactly integral? Like, you know, three persons, one essence, right? Like, like we were talking like this tension between civilizations and like, um, in Quinn's where, you know, quickly where she's emphasizing, you know, in where the world, uh, the world made the, the West or the Silk Roads, where it's the connections, between the civilizations that are a necessary part of the civilization. But then it's kind of weird to think that the essential, uh, an essential dimension of civilizations are the roads between them. Well, what the heck? What's the value of right. roads? Like the connect? Well, the Trinity is a kind of three persons where there's a kind of cord between them, right? There's a kind of connection between them. Right. If you're emphasizing the kingdom of God, you're saying that the point of is God to redeem the world, not to escape the world. All of these are emphasizing a different theology. And I definitely think right. that all of the old theology, the traditional religions are finding themselves having to find within them a theology that is more integral. And maybe that's a reason why the step is being skipped is because of the very horizon I'm, we are in. Yeah, I'm also reading uh, right now and I, you know, I'm just starting, but it's a fascinating book. It's uh, Berdyev. Nikolai Berdyev, which is a Russian Orthodox thinker who lived through the Russian Revolution uh, and then went back to Orthodoxy, but also, you know, was critically processing uh, his own tradition. And his last book is called The Realm of Spirit and the Realm of Caesar, right? And he has a, a purely relational view. He says, God only exists through man. There's this, so he says there's so God doesn't belong to the phenomenal world. He, there's the world of the spirit and the world of Caesar coexist, but they're not the same. And humanism, you know, is the is is you die. But if you if you turn to the spirit, you don't die, right? And so it's the spiritual world which lifts the human. But at the same time, if there is no human consciousness, there is no awareness of the divine. I And I, I just like, I really like his approach. Uh, and I'm not there yet. He has a, a five 
phase theory of of technology, mm. which is phase one, uh, em being embedded and not not conscious, so it is the archaic. Um, then participatory, which is the magic and the mythical. You know, you're co you're an agent with other agents, uh, co co constituting the world. Mechanism, which is industrialization. You separate from the world and you try to dominate it as an object. And he says, and now we're going to the total surveillance state. He wrote this like in the 50s, you know, where we had the danger of losing our humanity because the machines are taking over from the human. So the object takes over from the subject. That's phase four. And only after... <clears throat> Only after that is there, in his view, a potential, you know, fifth phase, which is the liberation uh, and, you know, the, the choice of the spirit world. Um, so, in a sense, you know, first we have to go to these dark ages uh, before we can go forward, right? And I, 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 I do have that feeling as well that I'm... And I, I think there is, you know, transcendence and immanence. And so we are seeking to bring them together. And the thing with immanence, you know, the temporality of imminent world, right, is we have all these cycles. Now, I think all the cycles are concatenating to a major crisis. So we are definitely in a downward spiral globally because nobody escapes global capitalism, global nation states, you know, we, you're Chinese, you're Persian, you have your own culture, but you've made your choices, you're in the same system, right? Uh, but it creates, and so it creates the seed forms of the future, and so in order to retain hope, it's important to be able to project yourself to the next up cycle. Right and and not to be lost in the declining cycle, so I, I think there is a place for you know that's what I'm trying to do, to to try to create narratives, which construct hope that are not just purely transcendental and give up on the world, but also seek hope in the world. And I think there's a very good way of framing it, which is, you know, we first we had an immature biosphere. Then we had a great oxygenation event, but it resulted in Gaia, Earth systems, where you know everything keeps each other in balance. So we have a mature biosphere, which created an immature technosphere, human beings. We have a technosphere which destroys the biosphere. And so now we have to move to a mature technosphere, right? And it's it's a very narrow road, but on the other side is a mature technosphere, which is an imminent life where humanity can live for thousands and thousands of years in balance with the environment. Anyway, that's that's the hope. No, I mean, Bajayev is fascinating because, you know, he had that emphasis and I'm indebted to Vegan Garoyan for introducing me to him and the meaning of the creative act, his work on Dostoevsky. And actually, Dostoevsky is very relevant here. You know, Berjayev had this real emphasis that um, the point, uh, God, the, the point is not to be, is not salvation, but co-creation. This real emphasis on man participating in co-creation uh, with God and Christ. And, he, and you see that emphasis for Berjayev was huge because then you had to tarry, dare I say, kind of a Hegelian term, a tarry with the negative. You had to tarry with materiality to co-create with it. If, you've, if you encounter difficulty in materiality, if you think the point is to be saved, then you need to escape that. But if you think the po point is co-creation, you need to think that and work with that and figure out how to actually bring it in the proper order. And for what was interesting about Bojayev is that he, he criticized both communism and capitalism as still being materialistic. Like neither of them was actually an alternative for him, uh, you know, and so he has that book on the Russian Revolution that's fascinating. 
And really, there's a way in which perhaps we are entering new, in a perhaps because it's very interesting that we've kind of skipped in a way to straight to integral thinking. I think that's true. It's almost as if we've realized that what we thought in the past were alternatives actually were not. They were still just materialistic and that there's some variable like of needing like the ideation space. Right. He would call that the spirit space, the space of creation where you're doing because you're like, God told me to be a co-creator. So even if I'm not making money for it or even if I don't have a market, I still got to somehow be developing skills outside of that space in the common space so that when then I'm sent, because that's another structure of like, got you, you, you know, a way that maybe is into, right? Or Kozad, they were talking about how you could look at the Bible as a structure of in the, the first Testament, God is making a people like, and then he sends the people, right? But he's assuming the people that he sends are still like, you know, that they're bringing with them value, right? There's not this sort of like, and that's a mistake that some evangelical Protestantism kind of um, mistakes, because you could say that in Paul, you're supposed to go and in a way be in different places where you're beautiful that attracts people in, not using propaganda to tell them, join my religion. But that means you're from a place of ideation, from spirit bringing spirit into spaces that are then attracting people into that alternative. If you just go in saying that the world's going to end be saved, then you're just contributing to the entropy. Actually, you're not bringing the ideation. And so Nicholas Bajayev on that emphasis on the meaning of the creative act. And I think this is true. I don't think it's by chance that there's all this emphasis now that integral and art go together, that creativity and art go together because creativity, the act itself, not merely the product of the creative act, like the painting, the act itself of writing a short story or being in a cipher is the perfect mixture in a way of the material and the idea. Because you're here and you're not here at the same time, right? You're in the material world, you're in the, you know, you're in the earth, but not of it. That kind of Jesus phrase, right? And so Berjayev in really centering, trying to center Christian theology on that creative act is looking for an actual alternative to communism and capitalism. And he, and also, funny enough, he sees Dostoevsky as basically tracing out three options of what the modern world is going to be. Alyosha, Dmitri, and Ivan Karamosov. Alyosha is very kind of spiritualist. But he has to go through with Raskin, a dark night of the soul, to realize that he was using spiritualism to escape being in the world, right? Because he's made an idol of Father Zosima. And then when Zos Zosima starts smelling, he has a dark night of the soul. Dimitri is kind of the henothist, and he gets accused of a murder. And even though he's innocent, he still wants to be guilty for it. And then Ivan Karma, so each one of them, regardless what direction they go in, have to go through some sort of um, dark age that then makes them realize from their own unique orientation. So what's interesting is that the main character, in a way, the main character of the Brothers Karmosa for all three paradigms of what the modern world could be all require some sort of going through a darkness to awaken. Uh, and that right. seems to be what's going on. Because with Ivan Karmosov, you know, everyone also is like, well, obviously it's the um, Grand Inquisitor section. But the critical, critical move of Ivan Karmosov, in my opinion, um, is one noting that freedom alone without creativity is not even freedom. That was like that was like a big thing for Berjaya. This was the mistake of him of capitalism is if you locate freedom simply in the options of materiality, you have more choices of materiality. That's not really freedom because you're still in the entropy, if you will. Freedom was only found in the creative act. I think he has a book called Spirit and Humanity, where it, like freedom is in spirit and spirit is creative act in co-creation. And so, you know, Ivan Karmosov is basically like, you know, if people are going to use freedom for evil, I'm going to turn my ticket back in. But then critically, Ivan later on, you know, Ivan is the one who says, not Alyosha, Ivan earlier in the book says something like, if everything, if, if God didn't exist, everything would be permitted, right? That's the famous line. Well, wait a minute, Ivan, that means Ivan's whole anger at God for giving man freedom requires there to be a God to be angry at. So he's caught in a paradox where he can't be upset about the death and abuse of children unless there's a God of which would make that wrong of whom he's upset at allowing, right? So there's a certain bam, paradox that occurs that then results in Ivan's madness. And I believe the Brothers Karamosov was supposed to be like book one of seven of the Great Sinner series, right? And so for Berjayev, really noticing that kind of contradiction that every character ends up with, because in a way, 
the inescapability of contradiction is the invitation to the integral thinking, right? Because if there's a contradiction, then we have to somehow integrate with the tension and create with the tension, right? Because a contradiction in a Hegelian sense has a has a motivational force, right? So if you're in a world, so basically, I think what Bajayev is getting at, if you're in a world where you say, huh, there's truth to civilizations, but then there's also truth to cross pollination, right? There's there's truth to um, the idea that we're it's dangerous to overly emphasize civilizational thinking, but then it's also dangerous to act like civilizations are all the same, right? Because you could argue that's the mistake of Francis Fukuyama, right? Well, there's a contradiction there. Right. And so for Berjayev, the only way to have freedom is to find some sort of possibility of a creative act or a creative subjectivity in the midst of that contradiction. And that thus makes it integral. Right. Well, what is a creative space but a common space? A common space like the author, when they're writing a short story, they're not being they're probably not being paid for it. They might be living off ramen or something like that. They're, they might be sitting like Faulkner on a wheelbarrow writing. The common space is the space of the creative act. And then the market is where you sell the creative act or maybe the politics is then you figure out the late legal framework for the creative act. But if you don't have the comments, you don't have the social infrastructure for the creative act without which you're just stuck in an endless materialism. And it's almost as if now a reason the spiritual, forgive me if I get the language wrong, but the more kind of out of world thinking, it's almost like the re it's almost like there's an intuition, maybe subconsciously, that there's an there, we can't make that mistake anymore that that's not actually freedom that's actually still operating as if materiality is opposite of spirit which is still a mistake right like if in in fact if if materiality and spirit are all together and and then then and that is freedom is a horizon and social imagination that is so operated by that then that's the way we have to think and we and we don't create a, spo a social space for that development without a commons. And it would be interesting. I don't know if anywhere Berjayev, Berjayev is someone to me who's absolutely in that idea because he does definitely talk about like communities that gather, you know, Bloomsbury Group, Vienna. Like there's something about those as being like humanity, like the common space. That might not be a language he uses, but he's definitely of the opinion that something like that is the only way to create an incubation of a different kind of subjectivity that's actually free, as opposed to simply choosing between material options. Um, and then what, you know, and basically also when we're talking about the difference like civilization and roads, you know, the, the material and the spirit, the ideation space and the creation space, all of that sounds like an either or, but when you look really close at the creative act, you see it in play. You see it practice. The creative act is using materiality to do something that is not reduced to materiality, right? You're using civilizations in order to make new roads, right? Like that, that the creative act, I guess, you know, away Bajayev, what's interesting, and then I'll give it back to you. For Bajayev, we paid way too much to the labor act, the worker in the factory, to the owner act, the guy who owns the means of production. And we're just kind of thinking about that. We haven't paid enough to the material spiritual act per se of the creative act. The cre you know, I um there's the owning of the means of production, you could say, there's the working of the means of production, but then there's the creating of the means of production, right? And that seems to be very different. And Burjayev's like, if we don't emphasize that, right. we're just stuck forever between materialistic options. I, you know, I just came back from something called Edge Esmeralda, you know, which is how the Web3 community creates collective learning. And so they congregate in certain physical spaces, stay together one, one month. So there were 1,000 people, 17 events per day. And I feel I really witnessed something special, which is this kind of enormous collective learning, creation of new uh you know the creation of a new culture a translocal culture and you know i i can give also a lot of critique of its limitations but I, I think something is is happening there and so maybe one of the themes we can discuss is this you know basically that our world was geographic that civilization is geographic a relation between agriculture and the cities and that we're now creating something translocal translocal communities which organize digitally and are relatively autonomous from their physical grounding. And 
but of course they cannot be 100% because they need food, energy, their bodies. And so an interesting topic is that, you know, what's the right relationship between, uh, and so the word that Jordan Hall uses is civium, right? Is uh, we're building not civilization, but civium, which is this translocal uh, capacity. Uh, I also have a query which we might discuss at some point about what's the subject of change. Mm. So you know, if it's not if it's no longer the working class or old style politics. So is it the commoner? Is it you know Web three? Is it? So I'd like to mention a few authors that uh, you know make us look at the subject of change somewhat differently, like Earl Thompson and the Juvenel. So, I mean, but I, I think for today, we, we have, um, you know, done quite a review already of civilizational thinkers. I would have liked to spend more time on Quigley, but again, I think we, we have enough for today. Well, I've enjoyed it very much. And I think actually Burjayev is a wonderful kind of note, because I think ultimately Burjayev, the Russian thinkers are interesting because they're neither Europe nor Asia. They're they're this weird middle place. They're trying new social arrangements, but then they fail. And what now? And there's this kind of there's a way in which the Russian mind has a kind of like dark ages uh, that it's wrestling with in of itself. That's almost like a micro dark age that can help us think these thoughts um, that need to be taken on, especially when Berjayev is writing. And I think he would, um, not that I mean to speak for Mr. Berjayev, I think he would be he would be extremely interested in the cosmolocal, the translocal, the idea of scaling game egg, you know, that idea that has never before been possible because it is suggesting a community that is spiritual, that is that is material, but not reducible to material. Yeah. And it it and that's a critical shift in history. Yeah, and by the way, the, the first translocal communities were the spiritual communities, yep. right? I, I, uh, Spengler mentions that. So the, you know, the 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 caliph, you know, the they they are heads of translocal religious communities, right? Not physical. They're it's for Christians and Muslims everywhere, independent of their location. So that was like a. A prefiguration of what we're doing now with technology, which allows us to have minds connected in the newer sphere, right? We're creating this newer sphere. You know, we have the the bio, the geosphere, the biosphere. Now we have the newer sphere. Anyway, this is uh, I think for another. No, I, I I think that is huge. Another, just as a closing note, another thing that, you know, uh, one thing that religions did that when if we removed the emphasis on religion in society that we may not have realized religion was doing is that even if you're a Christian, then even when you encounter people around the world, they are potentially Christian or they're potentially people, even if they have different nationalities, there's a potential connection. Now, it could be an antagonist relationship, but there's a framing of a possibility of invitation that if you remove the religion, then you just have the nationality identity. And you could say, well, let's try the humanity identity. We're all humans. Well, that's too vague for people. It doesn't have enough definition. Or you say, well, what about the capitalist? Oh, well, then you're under that paradigm, right? Well, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I used to be very much on the left side, and I, I consider Marxism to be like a religion. So the religion tried, you know, to create a unity around spiritual unity, but they remain in rejection of other, you know, spiritualities. Um, and the way for, and then the na the nation was also a new way to create unity at a, you know, at, at a geographic scale, right? As a result of the failure of the religions, it's because of the reformation, the civil wars that people came up with this capital state nation integration. Um, and then the dream of Marxism and socialism was to create a higher unity of all humanity based on working class value creation. You know, proletarians of the whole world unite. It failed. And, and people always choose the nation above their class. Like when push comes to shove, you know, the Socialist Party of Germany voted the war credits. 
and and when the Russian Marxists had power, they chose Russia over you know the global unity of of mankind. They they introduced nationalism. Um, and so this is a this is the key I think of how do we create a planetary society? Is can we? So the the I think the Russian Chinese dream, but also represented by Trump and Brexit, you know, as a sovereignist, is a, some kind of a revival of of the nation state. You know, away from globalism and neoliberalism, and you know the state represents the common good and controls the market and defends the local people. Um, but th th that doesn't solve the problem of planetarity. I think, you know, it's it's still within the old paradigm. Okay, the market internationalism didn't work, so let's try state internationalism again, right? So this is this is the the, the the struggle now, and I think what what people around the commons represent is using translocal institutions, right, to create domain specific unifications and then relations between these domain specific and unlike the neoliberal you know davos uh, paradigm which is multi-stakeholder multi-stakeholderism without the people right uh, i think this is multi-stakeholderism with the people um that's kind of the and you know, and but we need to find a way that to make that work together with the market and the state. And so my work with you know, I call it fourth sector organizations, which I think the web three people are trying to initiate with DAOs is a meta integrative form of organization that can integrate market, public authorities, voluntary and permissionless contributions in a higher level integration. It's not fully working yet, but it's already partially working. So I think this is the direction that you know we're trying to move. But we no. need to find a way to coexist with nations and markets. I think that's brilliant. Um, I think just I think what your analysis of Marx is great. It may have been Berjaev who basically says the form of the communist uh, party is basically the Catholic Church, like the very governing structure yeah. has a church like structure to it or Bukharkov. I think it was Berjaev. Um, and and there absolutely is this kind of idea that we can unify unify everyone on uh, labor. What's interesting is it's almost as if um, what you have to into, like unify everyone on creativity, which is a kind of labor. It's a kind of act, uh, but it's different because it's also not reducible to labor. And you can't separate the conversations uh, in the in the marketplace from the creative act because that's where you get the inspiration to do the work. And then you want to share it with other people. And it's also not reducible to the logic of market uh, because it doesn't exist yet, but then it can enter market. So there's something about the creative work of which everyone can do. It, well, that's kind of the premise. That's a lot of what belonging again is kind of asking is like, is it possible for any given person to actually follow an intrinsic motivation or more of a creative activity or a sort of creative act? They don't necessarily have to be painters, but that kind of mode of subjectivity, um, you know, it's a big question. That's what peer production is about, right? The difference yes. between peer production as a paradigm is you create an open ecosystem which signals what it's needed and then people can voluntarily adhere yes. to this common project. And then you create a, an economic system afterwards, which makes it possible. And so the problem today is that the capitalist system doesn't allow for that kind of risk easily, right? Because if you're in a commodity labor, you only work if you find a salary and then you sell your work. But if you first do the creative act and create a new before knowing if there is a market for it, you know, this is the whole difficulty. Yes. And I think the Web3 world is trying to create methods of financing that allow this to happen, at least for a growing minority, right? So open source was the first kept, the first time the world could coordinate labor on a global scale outside of the full domination of markets and states through you know open signaling stigmergy in these open ecosystems but 
nobody knew how to pay the core of the collective work. And so the multinationals came in and started controlling open source software because they're the ones paying the collective work, like, you know, IBM with Linux, right? The Web3 system has created a financing mechanism through crowdfunding that allows a huge multiplicity of sor sources to invest in the dream, right? That That is then represented in tokens as micro shares. And then you keep like 40% of those revenues for the labor, right? So they found a way to fund open source work. And now what they're doing, they're taxing themselves to what they fund public goods. And then they found new mechanism of decision-making like quadratic voting and quadratic funding, which are anti-oligarchic, so which limit the power of money and heighten the power of contribution over time. So it's it's very interesting. And but you know, we can talk another time in detail about about all the innovations that are happening in that sphere. Because you know, I think, yeah, we've okay. we've talked long enough. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed it and and uh and I yeah, I will have to close here in a second because I have like 20 minutes of batteries. I think there is very good reason to think that humans, if they are provided social infrastructure will in fact do work on the spiritual side even before it has market confirmation if other people are doing it. Like, you know how the example I make is, you know how in college they always said, have lifelong learning? Oh, really? Unless I live near the college, how am I going to find other people to talk about Hegel with, learn with Hegel with, et cetera, so forth, right? And in fact, if you left college and went off and lived in a small town and read Hegel, it might make you lonelier because you are interested in things that no one else around you is interested in, right? But now with the internet, it is literally possible to overcome that social coordination problem, where if you wanted to read Hegel, you don't need to just live in a college area. You could be anywhere and actually be able to find people to support you in that in learning for learning sake right? It, there is now the infrastructure for the possibility of learning for learning's sake. And I actually think a lot more people, I think, I don't think there's any reason to think that people won't do that if there is the plausibility structure, the social infrastructure to do that. That's then, then that's just a matter of exemplars following Peter Berger, um, you know, all the sociologists, Hunter, the advanced cultural making. So likewise, if you theoretically had a way to make spiritual work, creative work sustainable before the market, if there's an infrastructure for that and everyone else is doing that, then people feel permission to do that and they can be sustained for that. And now we have made infrastructural, if you will, the spiritual work, the ideation side that before was in was off in the religions, right? And it was more, I don't want to say happenstance, but it wasn't part of the social schema by which we were thinking, right? It's like religion had this function and we kind of didn't realize it had this function, right? Like there was this like, oh, really? Oh, glad glad that was happening. We didn't know that was going on, right? But now you have the infrastructure by which more and more people on average can see others doing it and they see a means to do it. And then it's just a question of like, Child psychology, right? If we're going with Freud, Lacan, Deleuze, what do people do? What do And what do kids do? I mean, this is where Deleuze has a point. You watch kids, they turn into turtles and they're looking for connections and they're very creative until they go to school and they're told that's a waste of time, right? If you look at children, there's reason to think that humans will, in fact, do spiritual work for spiritual sake. It's just that when they get older, they go, oh, no one else is doing this and I'm impractical. Oh, I better stop. And then you withdraw. But if there was a different in infrastructure, there's no reason to think you couldn't spread that kind of that kind of motive. And now we have the technology to do it. Uh, and then it's just kind of going through the details and things. But Michelle That's Bowen. A beautiful way to end because it's almost midnight here. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got like five minutes, five seconds of battery. I really appreciate it, Michelle Bowen. It's always a pleasure, sir. Thank you yeah. for your time. Have a good one, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Yeah, thank you so much.